So first off, uh, my name is Anthony Kaufman, and we're gonna, I'm going to lead a discussion. We're just going to talk for uh, a while, and then we'll open it up to questions from you guys. Um, I am an um, indie film journalist, I guess. Um, started out at IndieWire um, and basically been yeah, reporting on Christine's accomplishments for the last you know, 15 years or so. Um, By the way, I really liked seeing that you uh, reposted that happiness uh, post, yet was it yesterday? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was yesterday. Yeah. So that that was a real trip down memory lane. Yeah, I, I it wasn't my decision, but uh, yeah, um, how many years ago was that? Nineteen. Uh, it was fifteen years ago. Yeah, um, yeah. Todd Solon's film Happiness, which uh, Christine produced with um, Ted Hope, um, was one of yeah one of the great films that Christine was involved in, and um, it was kind of a sordid story what happened. Uh, the distributor uh, um, dropped the film basically because, you know, there was some content in it, like a lot of the films that Christine <laughs> has produced that, you know, push, push buttons. And, uh, you know, the corporate parents got nervous and dropped the movie and they, they had to release it themselves. So, yeah, that's, that's one, one example among many of uh, the, the films that, that you've done. I wanted to, um, because we're at New Fest, I wanted to start off um, with the beginning of your career and 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 the the, the that historical moment, um, you know, during the AIDS crisis, during um, a very heated you know political moment among um, gays and lesbians in New York, and and uh, I was reading you know your your second book, and thinking about the context in which you you know came to came to make films. I was wondering how much did that Political energy inform your 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 filmmaking because it was, I mean, it was clearly you know as the book describes it was all over the place that that energy that that protest. Um, how much did that fuel fuel your interest in making movies? Well, you know, it's a interesting question. I often get asked about you know <clears throat> the so-called new queer cinema and what that was and what it meant, and uh, and. I think that what often gets taken out of the equation when people talk about, I mean, Anthony and I were just talking outside about, um, you know, uh, uh, when Swoon went to the Sundance Film Festival in, in 1992, uh, it was the same year as The Living End by Greg Araki, um, The Hours in the Times by Chris Munch. There definitely was a lot of, of films that seemed to be organized around so-called, you know, queer themes. That said, I think what's missing, looking back 20 years, is the sense of urgency, because it's really hard to imagine now that there was a sense then that if you didn't tell your story now, you weren't going to get to tell it. And that was it. I mean, people were dying all around us, and it was such a state of crisis, and we were so young, I think that, uh, that a lot of filmmakers kind of went to that extra that, that, that extra place to get their stories out there because they felt if they, if they didn't, they maybe never would be able to. And that, I believe, really informed a lot of those early movies in a way that's hard to imagine now. What about for you? Um, you know, absolutely, but I, I feel like first I had the great good luck to uh, you know, be working with Todd Haynes when he was putting Superstar together and looking over his shoulder and uh, thinking to myself, like, you know, he's never going to make another one of these that doesn't have my name on it. Uh, and I, my name is on Superstar, but as I always clarify, I did not produce it. It gets attributed to me all the time. And even though I'd love to just say, uh-huh, yep, thank you, uh, I, it, I, didn't, I didn't produce it. Um, but it was a film that was a real catalyst for me because it was so well made and had so much of everything that I thought it kind of, well, I guess it kind of came, it brought together for me, okay, this is a movie that is provocative, it's entertaining, um, it's well done, it has something to say, and that's, that's, those are the kind of movies I want to make. Um, and once I realized that, it sort of started me on a trajectory of making those movies. I then said to Todd, you know, I really want to produce your, your feature film. And that was, then we were off to the races. To, to Poison, yeah. yeah. I, mean, it, uh, it's, I mean, it's funny looking back. 
you can't imagine that a film about you know Barbie dolls would have launched the career of you know one of one of you know the most prominent indie directors we have and one of the most prominent indie producers we we have and and you know going to it's a nice seg to Poison because um, obviously Poison was one of these films that people do cite as you know the beginning of, of the new queer cinema um, but again that film you know at the time y you guys couldn't have expected that it would have launched anything you know i mean it's a that's a that's a it's an experimental film you know it's a it's but a challenging the far film. right to thank for a lot of the reason uh because honestly what got poison you know uh, what, what kind of launched it into uh you know a much bigger distribution arena was the fact that it got an nea grant and uh, Donald Wildman, who was around back then too, sent a letter to everybody in the um, in 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 the House and and the um, and the Senate, saying, "Your tax dollars are going to finance gay pornography." Uh, we, met, you know, suddenly Todd and I were on Entertainment Tonight. <laughs> we were on Crossfire. We were on all this, and honestly, I think what happened was a lot of people went to see the movie and were like, "Well." Uh, you know, like, <laughs> this isn't really that pornographic, you know? And I, and I do think, I mean, it was two things. It was the fact that the gay audience at that time, or the gay and lesbian audience, there was so little for us. And as soon as you heard that something was even remotely gay or lesbian, the gay audience flocked to it. Also, it was a very easy time to aggregate your audience, um, you know, pre Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, people just, they went to bars, they had parades, uh, there were film festivals. It was very easy to say, to, to just directly target people and say, this movie is for you. Um, I think what happened with Poison was a lot of people went to see it who never in a million years would have seen a film that experimental and really came out like, I thought I was gonna see some boys kissing, you know, <laughs> instead of all this like, Janae stuff, you know? <laughs> I mean the 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 the, <laughs> the early uh, the early queer films that you were involved with, uh, and I was reading this in the, in the book, reminded me, you know, that that what you were doing wasn't the kind of safe, maybe sentimental, gay cinema that like you know existed like Longtime Companion. I mean, it was funny. I read, uh, you know, Parting Glances, the film that you first started with was, um, you know, you called bourgeois, you know, it wasn't your style. I called it that then. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> but I was only 25 or 26 years right, old. Right, right, right. But you were aware that, that the films you were interested in were, were, were not fitting in with, like, what was the most accessible brands of, of, you know, gay cinema at the time. Well, that's true. I mean, I, and I have to say, now I have incredible appreciation for both Parting Glances, which launched my career, not, launched me as somebody interested in, in film. And the director of that film was incredibly generous to me in terms of access, letting me see his process. Um, but I also have tremendous exp uh, respect now for Longtime Companion and see it as the groundbreaking movie that it was. You can't trust what a 25-year-old <laughs> thinks. That said, you know, we were never on the right side of the gay, politically correct. I mean, when we made Swoon, you know, people got really upset. Glad got really upset. In fact, I've yet to go to a Glad event. And um, uh, it was the same year as Basic Instinct, which was being, you know, reviled, even though I'm a little like, it's about a gorgeous, rich lesbian who murders horrible straight men. Like, what's so bad about that? <laughs> Why is that not a positive image? But we were being tarred with the same brush, and there was a whole, it kind of forced a discussion uh, that was actually, I, I think a very interesting discussion and probably one that we still are having on, on a different level, but it forced a discussion about like what makes an image gay positive or not gay positive. And at that time, it was like, it was very much like, well, we're just like everybody else and anything that deviates from that is not positive. Anything, I mean, Swoon to me is a gloriously complicated uh, movie about these, you know, about horrible people who happen to be gay. Um, and uh, it just, what we were basically being told was in this crisis, you know, the AIDS crisis, you have no business making a movie that, you know, even implies that a gay person could ever kill a child. And it's like, hello, 
you know? I mean, this happened. And a lot of those things, a, a lot of the things that make that crime resonate, I mean, people are still fascinated with the Leopold and Loeb case. The movie allowed us a way to sort of, you know, get into that and, and, and unpack it a little bit and see why it was so resonant. Was it, imp uh, I, and at the time, were you thinking about, you know, we need to, we need to kind of break open what, you know, how people are defining gay cinema, what people are thinking of it? I mean, I, I guess that's a sort of grand idea, but I'm just wondering if you were, you know, if you were conscious of the fact that you wanted to, to, to do something different, you wanted to kind of break, break ground. Well, I just wanted to make movies I thought were interesting, and I kind of, I've realized pretty early on that I was, almost no matter what I did, I couldn't really win. Like, I made Poison and Swoon, and suddenly came at, under a lot of criticism from uh, lesbians who said, see, she only makes men's movies. And I'm like, I've made two. Give me a minute, right. you know? <laughs> um, then I made Go Fish, and, uh, which again, I didn't do to appease anybody. I did it because it was a, I, you know, I saw some kick-ass footage and I was like, wow, I've never seen anything like this before. Um, and then I thought, well, okay, this'll cut me a break there. And then I was told, well, you know, it represents a very small portion of the lesbian community. It's ageist. And <laughs> it's like, you know, I can't win, you know? So, um, and then, of course, I shot Andy Warhol. Don't get me started on that. that. That was, people were not happy about that either because, again, it was the serial killer problem. Right. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, I just, I, I can't, every movie I make, I hope, look, one of the things I'm most grateful about is that I do maybe once a month, somebody comes up to me on the street and says, you made my favorite movie and I never know what movie they're gonna say. And that's great, because if you make a number of movies that are strong enough and personal enough to be somebody's favorite movie, that's kind of all you can hope for. Yeah, there's, there's a quote in your book that, you know, the, the most uh, um, brave films, or I can't remember how you described it exactly, but you know, the challenging film, those are the, room, those are the, those are the films that you know, divide, divide the room, divide the audience, in an industry where you know, the audience is all supposed to agree. Right. right, and and the films, uh, you know, they are different for for everyone, and you know, some people are gonna hate them, and some people it's gonna be their favorite film in the world. So you know, I mean, I I, I certainly that's not by choice. That's t that's your taste, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. How do you define that? What what you know what what you like? I mean, it's kind of like I know it when I see it. You know, uh, what I I when people send me stuff and say this is, you know, a gay coming of age story or a gay coming out story. It's right up your alley. I'm like, eh, usually it isn't. Um, but, uh, uh, but I don't, you know, we don't ever, at Killer, we don't have a mandate that's like, okay, we gotta do two romantic comedies, two, uh, two genre movies, and one, you know, uh, you know, one big budget Hollywood comedy. We don't, we really just go after the stuff that we like, and our slate is very, very eclectic, and I want it to stay that way. I'm not sure you can define, oh, that's exactly, you know, that fits right into Killer's Wheelhouse. That said, I love true crime, and that's something I keep kind of going back to. Um, so, because, you know, those are the things that kind of cross, you know, they, Again, as I said earlier, the, when there's a crime that for whatever reason just sticks in the public's teeth, it's usually for some deeper reason that I kind of love exploring cinematically. Mm -hmm. In terms of this question of mandate, I was actually thinking, do you, I mean, do you feel any responsibility because of your track record, like, to, you know, to produce the important gay filmmaker's film or the, an, an important, you know, woman director or, you know, does that weigh on you at all? You know, I kind of don't think about it, but as it's turned out, we really do do a lot of women's films and we really, we really do do a lot of, of gay filmmakers' movies, but I don't put that in front of, is the movie great? And, you know, I, and is the story, it becomes so complicated about, what, you know, that old, the question of like, well, what makes a movie really gay? It's like, what makes a movie really independent? Which is the other 
big question, you know. And every year when the Independent Spirit Awards uh, nominations are announced, you know, there's always that discussion of like, but that movie isn't really independent because it was financed by this or it was financed by that or because it had this big star in it or because that director has made studio movies. It's, it gets, it kind of, I feel like the same lens is put on what makes a movie gay, you know, and you can argue about it till the cows come home. Like, is Mildred Pierce gay? Is it? You know, I produced it, Todd directed it, somebody described it to me as gay crack, <laughs> but, but there's no, there's not a gay storyline in there. Right. Sure. Right. Let's, uh, that reminds me, one of the areas of discussion I want to talk about was you, and, you and, and Todd, you know, that collaboration made several films, you know, several important films. I, uh, Sorry to say, I don't have HBO. I didn't see Mildred Pierce. But I, I suspect that it's one of the best films of the year, even though it's on TV. Um, and so what has that relationship been like o over all these years? How have you guys, do you think, developed as a producer-director kind of team? What has gotten easier? You know, what is, is there anything that's gotten harder? Uh, is there anything that's, um, that you, you, know, you can say has, has, has developed about that relationship? Well, I mean, it's developed as any fine friendship does over the years. Uh, I think that, you know, because we really started together, and when we started making Poison together, we kind of had that great gift of ignorance. I mean, I had no idea how to produce a feature film, so I didn't know it was hard. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And Todd had not, you know, he'd made Superstar, you know, basically like, you know, in his living room and staying up all night, you know, uh, crafting tiny little gold records. Um, but he hadn't made a movie with a real crew yet either, so he had no idea it was hard. Uh, and we kind of just jumped off that building together. And, um, and then, of course, you know, then it went to Sundance and it won the Grand Jury Prize, so I was like, well, how hard can this be? And I've never won it again, which is really, it's really funny. I mean, uh, you know, 60 movies later, I've never won it again. Um, but so that, that experience, making that movie and really learning together uh, was extraordinary. And then, you know, we made some very tough movies. After, after Poison, we made Safe, then we made Velvet Goldmine, then we made Far From Heaven, then we made I'm Not There, uh, and then we made Mildred Pierce. Uh, each movie was, you know, insanely difficult to get financed, and we had to really be in the trenches together in a way that, you know, you can only do that if there's absolute trust. That doesn't mean we don't disagree. We often do, and I'm not afraid to tell him I disagree with something that he wants to do, and, and he's certainly not afraid to tell me when he thinks that I'm not seeing the forest for the trees and vice versa. But at the end of the day, I just have a real trust in his, I think he's one of the best filmmakers of his generation, and I'm just delighted I get to go along for the ride. Are there, what, are there any, I'm wondering if there are any incidents where you guys clashed that, you know, where maybe the, you know, the end result obviously ended up pretty good. I mean, honestly, we don't clash. It's just not, I mean, we, we don't really fight, except, you know, about who our favorite contestant is on Top Chef, you know? Uh, that's, yeah, that's kind of what we've sunk to. Uh, but, um, but there, look, in filmmaking, in film producing, there is an, uh, an inherent tension, and I think it's healthy for the film. There's a tension between the director, the money, and the producer. And that's what kind of keeps it all flowing and honest and accountable. So inevitably, there's times where I have to go and tell Todd something difficult. Sometimes I feel when you know, I work with financiers or a studio um, that really what they want, you know, what they see my job as is the one who has to go and actually tell the director that he can't have something, you know? Um, and they're, you know, like, absolutely not, and now go make sure he knows, you know? And that's, that's a real, you know, that's, that's a drag. So I have to figure out a way to come up with creative solutions, with, um, 
with a way of sort of seeing this before I even tell Todd or any director uh, what we're up against so that it's not a state of crisis. And, um, and that is something, you know, Todd knows because of our long working relationship and our trust, he knows that if I come to him and say, we're really up against it and we have to cut X, Y, or Z, that I'm not just saying this to make him, you know, to save money. He knows that we're really, you know, we're really up against it. Yeah, it's, it's crazy to me to think that I'm Not There was originally set up at Paramount, right? Yes. I mean, how many of you have seen I'm, I'm Not There? And this, this was the script that was given to Paramount, right? Yeah, I think the thing is that nobody could understand that <laughs> script. I mean, it's shocking to me that a major studio, you know, the, each, each... Because Dylan, there was a Dylan freak who was running Paramount at right. the time. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, but it, I don't know if it's, it, I mean, maybe it's a testament to Dylan or a testament to, to you know, Todd's um, track record making these films difficult uh, work you know, work financially, work in the marketplace, but... Well, I mean, Far From Heaven was his most successful movie, and we were coming right off of that. We then had a very difficult, not difficult, long and protracted, but actually not difficult, uh, uh, situation with, with the Dylan camp to make sure that we could actually represent that we had the rights to everything, because, you know, the music was laced throughout the script. When we took it to Paramount, it was an idea and it was a fait accompli with the rights. We have them. It was, there was rumors about Chronicles was being written, it was gonna come out. So all of those things were in, in play, you know. Uh, Todd had finally made a successful film that had gone to the Academy Awards. This was an idea that was obviously gonna attract cast. I mean, I basically, I would call an agent and be like, Todd Haynes, Bob Dill, yes. I haven't even told you what the part is yet. No, she'll do it, she'll do it. It was like that. The, the, but the, you know, the film is, you know, I think that may be one of the most like, experimental mainstream films. I mean, it beats, it beats Superstar, you know, and Poison. Right. I mean, and, and yet, it, you know, you got it made. It's, it's kind of a miracle, I think. Right. No, I, I agree. But, you know, uh, um, I mean, it is one of those things where, uh, you know, I mean, it's such a it's, a, it's a, it's a film that really, I believe, stands the test of time, and a lot of people have been telling me that they kind of put it on like a record album, like in their living room, and then they just like catch little bits and pieces of it, and, and then just do that over and over and over again. Uh, I, another good seg. Uh, brings me to Hedwig and the Angry Inch, um, which I think is like a record album, in fact. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and a tribute album. Yeah, right, right. Um, Another great film, um, and uh, you know, obviously a film with you know transgender transgender content that would would I mean I don't think would ever have been in theaters if it weren't for you. You know, would never have gotten made uh, and seen by a wider audience. You know, it was this little you know um, event in you know in the uh, in the West I guess at West uh, Village Jane Street. Yeah, Jane Street. Um, uh, tell me about getting that film. It made into a film at a studio again. This isn't. This isn't. This is independent film, but this is independent film working with New Line. You know? Well, I mean, I to New Line's credit, that was when Mike DeLuca was there, and I was going to see. You know, I knew John. Uh, Todd had actually followed the ori the origins of Hedwig, which I guess started at um, at. I, Squeeze box. That's right. So Todd already knew the character, and, and when he started uh, when he started performing, I went to see it uh, a couple of times, and um, and I was starting to think like, how could we take this to you know to to the screen? Um, New Line was interested very early on. I think primarily because of the music, um, but they were having a hard time seeing how this could be fleshed out narratively. Uh, we pushed John to go to the Sundance Lab um, where he had a couple of real breakthroughs in terms of how to open up the, the story, but he also came back saying, I wanna direct this myself. Now, before he went to the lab, we were talking about bringing in uh, another director because of course, how could you possibly direct yourself in something this complicated? So this is what we did. We had our director was in hair and makeup for four hours every day, and we used a first-time cinematographer. 
you know? Uh, because he had it looks a great. It looks fantastic, because he had a relationship with John. And again, it was one of those things, I had never tackled anything exactly like this, so I was like, oh, well, this can't, I mean, you know, who else could play Hedwig, and who else could direct Hedwig? So it all made sense at the time. In practice, the difficult part was the other actors who were like, hello, you know, where's my director? And, um, and the, 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 the physical demand on John was just like unbelievable. You know, I mean, he was, he was the first one in and the last one out every single day. You know, luckily on low budget movies, as some of you probably know, you can't shoot for that long. So was there any uh, any pushback on the content or any or or I mean do you remember anything anyone concerned about um, you know I mean it, you know obviously New Line knew what they were getting into you know especially the angry inch part but um, but there was I think there was at the end you know that this kind of alarm that the movie wouldn't cross over uh, but. I mean, in all honesty, when that happens, usually it's too late, you know? I mean, that's like one of the things I always say to people when you start a relationship to make a film together, whether it's with a studio or it's with a financier, is the most important thing is to know that you're all making the same movie. Um, all in all, New Line was very supportive. And I think what's happened to the film now uh, is it really has become like an evergreen. I mean, it just is, you know, it's like Rocky Horror. You know, people, every generation seems to discover it, put on that wig, you know. This, uh, this is kind of a vague question, but um, I'm just uh, thinking about something else that was in your book and about, I mean, all of, this, all of the films you've done, there's a tremendous amount of risk. You know, Hedwig, I mean, an animated sequence, you know, uh, the, you know, sort of narrative trickery going on. I mean, not a conventional, you know, narrative. I mean, just all of them. And there was something, you know, uh, in your book about, you know, when do you know that the risks are worth taking? I don't know how you can really answer that, but there is so much risk involved in the films that you're making. How do you know that that is a risk worth fighting for? You know, how do you know that that, that particular tricky thing that you're, you know, that you're all trying to pull off is, is worth trying to pull off? Well, we have to go through a pretty long process of um, of getting to, you know, knowing our director, knowing his, what his or her vision is, uh, making sure that he or she can articulate their vision effectively, and um, and really getting to the place where we say, okay, we're willing to really like go to battle for this movie, um, and if I can get it to that place then I, my confidence in it is pretty, it's pretty unilateral. It's just like, that's, we're gonna, we're gonna get this done. Um, if I feel like every now and then, and I, and I won't name names, there's been a movie where we felt on the way that the director has wavered, that his or her vision has maybe not been as clear as I thought. Uh, and that's when things get, scary. That's when it's like, uh-oh, what are we doing here? I mean, you know, how can we, we can't, we can't proceed unless we all know what, what, unless we all are behind this same, this, this same leap from the script to the screen. It, it occurs to me that maybe that's the, you know, the use of establishing relationship with these directors and, and you know, going back to them. I mean, I, I you know, you've, you've produced the, the same director's work, you know, repeatedly. I mean, obviously, Todd, but also um, 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 Betty Page and uh, Mary, Heron Mary Heron and Tom and yeah. Rose. Yeah. I mean, we've, right. you know, we like to work with directors again because it's kind of like after you've gone through that first time, the second time, it's just like, ah, okay, you know, I get you, you get me, etc. But we also, we still work with first time directors a fair amount, which is always exhilarating, often frustrating, but, you know, first time directors are usually. Uh, telling a story they've waited their whole lives to tell, and it's um, it's exciting. It kind of reminds me why it's fun. I noticed uh, on you know the IMDb page it mentioned a Hillary Brower film. Mm -hmm. um, 
Did you do sticky figures of time? I didn't. Oh, okay. Uh, but this movie, Innocence, we're hopefully going to be shooting in September, October. Oh, great. Um, I wanted to ask you about yeah some of the stuff you have in the pipeline. What can you talk about that film a little bit? Uh, well, that film uh, is a it's a vampire movie, but it's a lot more than that, obviously, or I wouldn't be doing it. With Abigail Breslin, takes place in New York City. Um, and uh, we're also shooting right now Ramin Barani's new movie, which is called the untitled Ramin Barani Farm Film, uh, with Zac Efron and Dennis Quaid. Um, and that is shooting in Iowa and Illinois, which just had our heat wave. Uh, so I was in Iowa a week and a half ago at my first NASCAR event, which I just do not get. I'm just like, that is like, whoosh. Like, I do not see the fun. Uh, but it was 107 degrees, and it was 120 in the pit, which is where we were. Uh, and, and poor Zach had to wear that whole, you know, the suit, the whole, the whole shebang. Um, so, uh, so that'll stop uh, sometime in October, and we're very excited about that. Do you, uh, just going back to the sort of queer cinema question that we started the conversation with, obviously, you know, Gay and lesbian content is somewhat mainstreamed with L word, and you know, queer cinema obviously doesn't have the same excitement buzz around it. Obviously, during that that heated moment, is there like a, 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 a I mean, you know, New Fest is showcasing you know obviously um, the latest in in gay and lesbian films, but where's the sort of heat? Is there a you know a gay and lesbian cinema that that you feel connected to anymore? I mean, I just feel, you know, I just feel connected to good movies. And the fact is, look, there's a lot of people coming up now, a lot of young directors of all different, you know, uh, uh, sexuality, but, but, but also from all different kinds of places who can, ever, there's no excuse for not being able to make your own movie anymore. I mean, you can, you know, anybody, can make a film now. And when a director comes in to see me, I expect them to have a short film. And I expect, them, I expect it to be good, or else I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna further the discussion. So that, this whole, you know, my daughter, you know, she watches, she, she really only watches media on her computer. And, you know, she's into finding those like, you know, insane YouTube shorts that, um, you know, that go viral, you know? Uh, so I, I feel like what the real question is right now is the way we are forming communities in different ways, um, you know, primarily online, but not exclusively, uh, the way in which filmmakers are finding and aggregating their audiences, and the fact that the way we consume media is bound to have an effect on the kind of stories we tell. All of those things, I think, are, you know, I, I, I sort of grapple with those constantly. Um, and, and in good ways. I mean, I, for the most part, I think it's, it's exciting. It's that, that kind of access that everybody has is a lot more exciting than when I started 25 years ago, and it was the rarefied few that could actually buy that can of film and rent that 16 millimeter camera. Your your embrace of HBO to you know do the the, the new uh, you know project by Todd. I don't know if he always wanted to make uh, an HBO miniseries. I doubt well, it. Well, I mean, look, most filmmakers, most directors think their movies uh, are too short, and uh, uh, Todd loved the idea of trying to do something in the long form. It was never. I mean, it would have been with all you know, with all due respect, it would have been stupid just to remake Mildred as a feature film. It's an iconic feature film that I'm sure a lot of people here can quote. And why would you do that? Why would you go and do that just to hold yourself up to like that kind of direct comparison? A miniseries that really explored James M. Cain's original novel was a departure in something, you know, something wildly different. But was it, was it also just like, you're saying like maybe an embrace of, of these new platforms, these new areas? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it started because I said to Todd, after that, Todd's pattern is, well, he says he does one for the girls and one for the boys, but it's like he'll do uh, a kind of crazy fractured, often musical narrative, like Poison, 
Velvet Goldmine, I'm Not There. And then he'll do very straight yeah. narrative, yeah, uh, like Safe and Far From Heaven, which, you know, don't, don't deviate from traditional Hollywood cinema uh, in form, but they do in content. So I knew after I'm Not There that he was gonna wanna do one for the girls. And I knew how hard it would be. Um, so I said, you might just wanna think about doing something that, uh, that, could go, that could be on television. Like, cause we'd been talking about the long form and mini series and all of that. And Todd actually watches TV. In fact, we went to the TCAs, which is the Television Critics Association. And he was you know, interviewed on stage and was talking about television and HBO and the shows that he really liked. And so one of the critics tweeted, finally uh, a director who directs for TV who admits to watching it. You know, and he really does. Um, anyway, that was the next day he came to me and said, you know what, I have the perfect thing, uh, Mildred Pierce, um, it should be on television, it's domestic, it should be in your living room. Yeah, no, it, makes, it makes sense. Are you doing other things now that, that take into account, you know, the changes in the business, the new, new platforms, internet distribution, um, you know, what, 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 you know what, how are you guys adapting? Well, we are, we're working on a, several original series uh, for the web, uh, some with partners, some without. Um, we're, um, you know, we're working, we're, we're trying out different ways. Well, actually, the last thing Todd and I did together was something for American Express, which was a live streaming concert uh, for a band called My Morning Jacket. And that was kind of crazy. It was completely unlike anything, I, it was kind of like doing live TV, I suppose, with a lot of hysteria and people pressing the wrong button and uh, that, you know. Um, so we're exploring all of it. I mean, I think what's starting to happen is we're realizing that we have to be uh, length agnostic and form agnostic and, and that's opening up a lot of doors. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, 10 years ago, it was pretty rigid. It was like you either fit into the feature film box or you fit into the television box, but there wasn't any real cross-pollination, and, and people really did one or the other. And now it just feels like there's a lot more room, and the web is becoming a, like a safe place to experiment. Is there anything from Killer's past that you, know, you think could, could be revived in, you know, that maybe didn't happen? that could be revived considering the sort of new, new options, new opportunities? You know, probably. Yeah. But when I have time, I'll go look, I'll go look in the files. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I feel like, you know, there is, there is so much else Definitely. out there. So, you know, you wonder. Um, I think, uh, should we, are we do, are we due for questions? Okay, then let's uh, take some questions. We have a microphone here. If you have a question, raise your hand. So uh, obviously you have a ton of uh, wonderful movies and I know now with digital downloads specifically, how's that been working for you guys and how are you tailoring any of your new projects, thinking release dates, changing things based on digital download? Like, like VOD you mean? Like, yeah, yeah, like... Um, I mean we haven't really, I can't say that we've really sort of made the, I mean obviously some of our movies like Cairo Time for example, uh, was e was reasonably successful theatrically, but enormously successful on VOD. Uh, what we haven't done yet is figure out a way to, you know, control those those platforms or those portals ourselves. Some of our old titles. This is how old I am. Is some of our old titles are com their licenses are coming back up for renewal now, which is great, but it's like, whoa, that was a 20 year license. Oh, okay. Uh, um, and so we're figuring out how to deal with those now in this new age. Like something like Swoon, for example, has come back to us because when we made the deal with, with Fine Line, there was no internet, so they didn't have those rights. You know, so that's we're, we're starting to play with that, but we're not I, we're not as into it as I'd like to be. Here you go, Kyle. 
Um, you mentioned yesterday that some things in Shooting to Kill were out of date. I wonder if you could, because I assigned that book for my students, <laughs> name maybe like a new one. five things that, um, <laughs> just to limit it, like the top five things that you would find are like, that's no longer at all, you know, like about the industry? relevant. Or, yeah, yeah, probably, you know, or, well, or how films are made by you or Killer. Honestly, in that sense, I think it's it's still basically the same. The biggest thing is, I wrote that book before there was uh, um, before you could shoot digitally. So it takes from its you know from you know its basic premises that everything has to be done on film, and that's you know that goes through the budgeting process, distribution, etc. So what I'd like to do is do a new version. Um, that takes a lot of that into account and a lot of the new sort of, you know, DIY sensibility that comes from that, you know? I mean, one of the things that's pretty exciting to me right now is filmmakers can kind of, you know, they can take it into their own hands. If you'd go to Sundance and you don't get bought, your, your movie doesn't get bought, that doesn't mean that your movie's dead. And it did used to, you know? And that, I think, is kind of exciting. So that's, you know, that's what my updated version will have in it. There was, there was uh, I guess it was in your San Francisco talk uh, that you mentioned. They, the San Francisco talk did not go well. Oh, no? Well, <laughs> it, on, they did not on, like that. On paper, it seemed just fine. But there was, there was, um, there was something about, like, I, I don't know if it was a contra contractually, you had to do, like, Twitter updates and Facebook yeah, updates for yeah. an upcoming film, something like that? Well, it's, it's actually not an upcoming film. It's an upcoming series of short films. Okay. But the contract states that we have to, uh, that me and the talent involved has to tweet at least, you know, two times during the actual production and, uh, and Facebook po post probably an equivalent amount. And then during the... Um, you know, when we're, when we're uh, doing publicity for it as well. So, yes, it was my first uh, Twitter written into the contract. Hi. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a fine line between making films for an audience and making films that have a strong kind of auteur or, you know, uh, strong director's vision. And I'm just sort of wondering how you... Cause I've seen lots of films recently that are clearly not made for an audience at all. Like, well, <laughs> I mean, I, um, I, every director I work with wants the most people possible to see their film. When I'm putting together money for a movie, because we have no subsidies here, you know, in, in the States, we have to, we have to figure out how to make our movies for the right amount of money so that they will return on their investment, so that our financiers will be happy and they'll invest in another movie. When I see a filmmaker uh, like go, go out, you know, uh, spend too much money on a film that is, where it's clearly not ever gonna recoup, that's bad for all of us, it really is. It just means that that financier is gonna be that much more hesitant the next time. So, uh, you know, even, the filmmakers that you might consider, you know, the most esoteric in my, you know, in my my stable, um, they know that they that they are in that constant discussion between art and commerce. Like, so Todd Haynes makes something like I'm Not There, but he knows damn well that you only get that movie made if you get exactly that cast. You know, you make that movie with Richard Gere and Heath Ledger and Christian Bale and Kate Blanchett. You don't make that movie with anybody who isn't A-list or it's not going to happen. He's well aware of that. So even though, you know, he may make films that, you know, that, that seem experimental, he knows how he has to balance it in order to do, you know, what he wants. I mean, it was the same thing, obviously, with Mildred Pierce was, you know, this was a, you know, female-driven, you know, five-and-a-half-hour drama HBO makes like one of these every two years. What's going to make them make this one? Kate Winslet. Thanks. And uh, and and you're always keeping your budgets, you know, very very streamlined. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, you, you, you're going to a long format now. Is episodic TV anything you consider? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, we'd love to get into episodic TV. We actually did make one series, This American Life, for Showtime, which was also, that was our first foray into, uh, um, into series television, and we won an Emmy, so we have a pattern here. Like we do, <laughs> do it once, win, oh, okay. Um, it'll probably be the only Emmy, no, I hope it isn't. I hope Mildred wins, you know, at least one or two. Um, so we're, we, what we really want to do is scripted television, and we've got a couple things in the works that hopefully will come to fruition. We have about five minutes left, but I, I wanted to ask a question as well. Um, and this one, I, and I had to step out for a few minutes, so I apologize if you t touched on this, but it's slightly, I was thinking about the last talk you did at Lincoln Center, which was across the street or a while ago at, at the Walter Reed. I think it was when your, one of your books came out. And, you, and you'd said something at that point about how um, at one point maybe you thought it would, at some point you thought it would get easier and it just, it's always just as hard <laughs> to sort of keep making movies. And this, is this question slightly goes into more personal nature because I think I want to sort of, I, I was thinking about sustainability a minute ago um, and the idea of sort of sustaining a career and sustaining um, yourself as a producer um, in a, environment that's changing. At the same time, um, you now have a daughter, you publicly acknowledged and, and talked about the fact that you battled and overcame cancer. Like, how has your, your viewpoint, your, your, your sort of vantage point on being a producer changed over the years, and how is it, how is it, does it feel harder, easier, more challenging? Like, I'm thinking about filmmakers in the room who are trying to aspire to be you, and it's like, it, it certainly can't be any, easier, and then you have you know, personal issues, family issues. Right. Has your perspective on all this changed over 15, 20 years? Well, I mean, you know, I, I do feel like right now it, it, there's so much opportunity. It is, what's hard is, is, you know, how do you, um, you know, I, I commiserate with Ted Hope every, you know, couple of days who says, I'm, I'm working twice as hard and getting paid half as much. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, you know, that's true for all of us. I mean, I, um, uh, you know, I, I sent an email to, a, um, uh, to somebody who I wanted to do some work on Ramin Barani's movie, and I said, uh, you know, this is a real, like, chump change job, but it's an interesting director, and he wrote back, there's no such thing anymore. Uh, that said, I feel like it's all, you know, to be a producer, it's all about being prolific and being open to all different kinds of, of production whether, you know, you don't have the luxury of just sticking to, you know, I'm merely, I am a feature film pro uh, producer and that's all, you know, that's, that's, that's how I create, have created my identity, which is what I did for years. And I, what I tried to do is when I realized that our business was changing pretty radically, I tried to, uh, to change with it as quickly as possible. So the only way to really sustain a career, I think, besides being the child of a billionaire, which is how plenty of people do sustain their careers, uh, um, is to really be as prolific as you can be, be open to, uh, to opportunity and to different kinds of production, um, and, uh, and really constantly look at ways to make the, the new, me new media, the ways we can reach out to our audience, all of that work for you. I mean, we're still figuring it out. I mean, what Killer did was we started a management company, you know, as a way of capitalizing on what I think is our strength, which is that talent wants to work with us. And, you know, that hopefully will be what takes us into the next decade, you know, in profit. Do we have one, one more? One or two more? Two more? So you're mentioning that you get a lot of first-time filmmakers sending you their uh, information and their short films. No, I mentioned that I work with a lot of first-time oh, filmmakers. Okay. Uh, see, I know where you're going, and you ha are you going to how do you get your script to me? No, I wanted oh, okay. to ask right, what, what are the I'm mistakes. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I sorry, do have sorry. my business card. Uh, what? What are some of the mistakes you see from first-time first -time filmmakers? filmmakers? Yeah. Um, I think, honestly, a big mistake is first-time filmmakers not having a sense of who their audience is um, and not being able to, to speak to that in any real effective way. Um, 
you know, I, I think I think that sometimes filmmakers will come to me and, and tell me that their movie will work because it's a cross between this film and that film without actually having done the research to know that maybe those films didn't do terribly well. Um, uh, you know, I, look, at the end of the day, um, you know, as I said, first time filmmakers are usually making the movie that they've that they've waited their whole life to, t to, to make, and, they, and there's a certain passion about it, and I wanna feel that passion. You know, I wanna see why is it this one, why is this the one that, that, you, you, know, that you are burning to get done? Well, since you didn't ask it, how do you wanna do get stuff to you, and how? how <laughs> You know, and how, uh, what, what type I'm of products too, are you looking for? When I'm too cavalier at these things, the next day, my head of development is like, what did you say to them? <laughs> um, you know, the way you get stuff to us is you contact my head of development, whose name is David Hinojosa, and usually if you email him a synopsis, uh, he will he will decide whether he thinks it's something we might be interested in. Do you take unsolicited? We don't take unsolicited. But we will hear, you know, we will take a, you know, a paragraph synopsis or, or something like that. Um, we can't take unsolicited scripts. It just got, like, it got ridiculous. So, you know, and as I say, you know, for a long time, I happily said we took unsolicited scripts because I got some good stuff that way. But then finally my office was like, you know, when you decide that you're gonna read each one of them, you can come to these events and tell people that we're, that we're accepting them. Otherwise, uh, again, we, uh, you know, go through David and, and you know, don't hand me things here because, you know, I, I'll probably lose it. But, um, but you know we have a we have a good system in place, and we we really do see a lot of stuff. Okay, um, I think that's all the time we have.